Welcome to episode 10. In this episode, we are chatting with our one and only Jordan Shea. Welcome Hi guys. to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we are diving into all things ads today. And of course, there is nobody whom we love more to chat about ads with than you. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that. So let's talk a little bit about your brand, your business, mm -hmm. what it is you do for your clients to give um, maybe everybody a little bit of perspective before yeah. we dive in. Yeah, so um, do a little bit of everything for small businesses locally here um, in Indianapolis, uh, working a lot with content strategy, long-term strategy, and a huge part of that is ads. Once a company gets to a certain point, I feel like ad spend it, on digital platforms needs to be a part of their budget. So that's something that I help a lot of small businesses with is deciding what's a realistic budget for them. Right. Because um, not everyone has $2,000 to spend on Google AdWords every month. Mm -hmm. um, so where's the best way to strategically spend money and how to even pay attention to those numbers and what they actually mean. So when we talk about ads, are we talking about SEO? Not, no. SEO is organic. SEO is everything you're doing naturally on your website. Okay. Um, there's a completely different term for if you're spending money to rank higher. And that's, I mean, that's, that is Google ads. There's um, paid Microsoft for Bing now. But when most people talk about paid search, it's not SEO and it's more often than not Google. So before we get to a place where we're spending money, mm -hmm. is it important that we're maximizing our reach through the organic methods using SEO? Absolutely. You should always be optimizing your content to perform organically. Um, if you don't have a strong organic presence, your paid isn't going to go far. Why is that? Uh, you're you're unestablished uh, both for the algorithm and for your audience. Um, nothing is more disconcerting than seeing like a product video in your feed and like actually being curious about it, and then like you can tell it's not a legitimate company or it's a drop ship company because you can't find anything about them other than this ad that they're running, and there aren't a lot of posts other than promotions, and the algorithm knows that too. So you definitely have to have a strong organic strategy. And that's why I talk a lot about building that content strategy long term before adding in the paid aspect of it. Um, a lot of people just jump in head first and try to spend money right out of the gate. And that's not a good idea either. I love that. I mean, it's so important for you to really talk about the mix up of your media and mm -hmm. really how you're optimizing yeah. the the, the natural reach and the natural conversations and all the things that can happen for your business without you having to put money behind yes, it. Yes, yeah. But then you get the beloved boost button. Yeah. Can we chat about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the biggest things, and I see people run into this all that time, is this post is performing better than XYZ, and you see it on Instagram now. Um, you should promote this because it's doing better. And what I say to that is why would you spend money to – pay for a piece of content to essentially reach people that it is organically reaching because it is performing well. Mm -hmm. Like, it, there's there's really no point in it. You Be strategic. Don't just throw money behind a post because the algorithm tells you to. Um, if you're boosting something, it needs to be a piece of content that you thought out in advance. The, I know a lot of like big ad buyers and professionals who deal with large companies say that boost is terrible. You should never boost a piece of content or boost a post. Um, so why do they give us that functionality? Because it's good. Because it actually is good for small businesses that don't have a lot of money. I mean, there's a better way to set it up through the ads manager, but promoting an existing piece of content in your feed isn't bad, but it, it needs to be strategic and it needs to be a post that you thought about living long term. Because that's what an ad does to a piece, to an existing post, a piece of content, is it kind of injects it. So is it an evergreen piece of content? Because one thing um, that I've run into, you know, like people get really excited about something, they post, mm -hmm. you know, they've won an award, and then they see that, you know, 95% better yeah. than all your other content. So you're like, mm -hmm. everyone needs to see that I won this award. Right. Well, if someone has no idea who you are, or even what that award stands for, like, why are you promoting it to them? Right. You know, it's maybe out of context. Maybe include it in a video that you're going to run an ad on, but right. you've, you've really got to be very intentional with how you're spending your money. But yeah, no, Boost isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah. So I would like to back you up to platforms. Yeah. So where, where are your clients at? Like, what platforms do you typically work with? So I typically work a lot with Facebook. Um, it's kind of like my home base where I've worked a lot with. Uh, through Facebook, I can run Instagram-only ads, which I prefer to do. I know a lot of people just pull up 
the mm -hmm. pay through. Mm -hmm. I can't stress this enough. If you're trying to go to the next level, put down your cell phone, open up a computer and yeah. work on your ads on a computer. The desktop is completely different. I know it looks daunting, but literally it, it works better. Um, so yeah, I work a lot with Facebook and Instagram. Um, I do a lot more LinkedIn nowadays. A lot of professionals uh, yes. and companies yes. want, want LinkedIn advertising. Um, Google, all sorts of Google. Google has a lot of ad options. Um, I've spent money on Twitter, but I mean, it's really, don't spend your money on Twitter. Um, and Snapchat and Pinterest are up and coming. I've like watched some videos, but I've never done that myself. So if anyone's curious and willing to try, yeah. <laughs> I would love to because they're, they're performing really well ad wise so I've seen a lot of a lot of um, push towards Pinterest lately and yeah so the one issue Pinterest has um, their customer service is kind of crud mm -hmm. and they're not as strong as Facebook yeah so they can't necessarily like have poor customer service mm -hmm. because yeah. they just, they're not as big of a brand um, snapchat is actually one of the up-and-coming stars for conversion rates really uh, cost mm -hmm. um, I get and customer service on Snapchat for their yeah, oh, ads yeah. mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And I'm always, I'm so mad at myself. I'm like, yeah. dang it, I needed to know the answer, but I can't make it to the 15th page. I'm out mm -hmm. after page two. Yes. Well, and I mean, <laughs> it's because they're so well designed and they're so engaging when they're Snapchat ads that it's it's really hard not to. And again, it goes back to their customer service and like helping people set up creative like that. Because yeah. they're, I mean. They're, it reminds me of the old like magazines, like the old, you know, Oh, J2 magazines and Teen Bop that we used to have. The Snapchat ads just feel very yeah. juvenile to yes. me. Yes. It's it, strange. Well, and that's part of the issue, actually. So um, part of the reason why people think Snapchat converts so well is because the audience is so young, mm -hmm. which begs the question, is it legal to be advertising on that platform if you know? Mm -hmm. And so, like, how are you doing age, like, things like that? Because sure. it's, it's also really easy to get around putting your age and your birthday on Snapchat. Right. Okay. Like, up until I think only, like, when I first started Snapchat years ago, it didn't even ask me for my birthday. It just mm -hmm. forced me, probably last week, to add in my birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah. So things yeah. are changing around there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really curious when it talks about conversion and, and mm -hmm. how you know you're getting the best bang for your buck, mm -hmm. how would a normal person who doesn't spend every minute of their day living and breathing ads be able to even wrap their brain around, is this ad campaign working? Mm -hmm. What should I be tweaking to make it perform better? Or was it just a complete dud all around? Yeah. So, um... Honestly, I would say sit down with a professional. Um, I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, mm -hmm. but um, every platform phrases the same metrics differently. They mean different things. The algorithm reads them differently. And then on top of that, a lot of times what I find is people are like, I want this conversion. But like their terminology or how they've set something up yes. does not align with what their goal actually is. So it's really hard to judge whether or not something's succeeding or failing when it's it's not even set up correctly. So I typically tell people like, if you just wanna know, you've gotta one, sit down and ask yourself, like what is my ideal goal with this? Because mm -hmm. then from there you can also pick out what is your most important KPI or k key point of interest. Um, you know, like if you're just trying to get eyeballs, then you're gonna want a really low CPM and that's how you'll know if it's succeeding. But if you're an online store and you're running for conversions, like you, physically wants, there's a column that'll tell you how much money you've made off of social conversions and you want something like that. Right. But so it's, it's very different based off of what your objectives are. So it's sitting down with someone who knows what they're talking about um, and knowing what your objective is. Because I know so many people are like, well, I want to get messages. Well, you're running it for engagement. It's not the mm -hmm. same thing. Right. It just has a message button on it. So yeah, talk with somebody who knows because it's a whole... Some of the metrics that I'm talking about too, you may not even be looking at the right interface to know whether or not it's succeeding and failing. So like, don't try to stress yourself out and read a million articles and get confused. Just, right. you know, someone like me yeah. or honestly a lot of media buyers that I know can open up a campaign and look at it and within 10 minutes be like, no, you're good or what, what the heck. Right. Yeah. So what are maybe some prerequisites mm -hmm. that I should be doing before I am at a point that I'm able and competent enough to put dollars behind my ads. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, 
how do I even begin to approach that conversation? So, and you and I have talked about a lot mm -hmm. about this is that, you know, am I even qualified to understand the analytics and to understand what it is I'm hiring somebody with the intention mm -hmm. to do without some sort of baseline understanding of how it all works? So are you asking like technically, what do you need to do before you get started? Just or? like from a, a general perspective of, what do I need to understand about my objectives, my goals, where I'm mm. trying to go? What do I need to be going to that person and saying to mm -hmm. them in order to accomplish my goal? Because a specific example would be, you know, I want conversions. I want yeah. more clients. So yeah. we'll speak to, about my industry for a minute. If I'm going to talk about real estate, I want to sell this house mm -hmm. or I want to find a client to um, potentially list a future home with me. So I'm going to assume that every ad campaign I do is helping me get closer to that goal. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you say is that it doesn't necessarily work that way. I can't run one ad mm -hmm. that's going to immediately put people in my inbox that yeah. is going to get me my next client. Yeah. So what is a better goal I should have and how should I be communicating those to an expert so that I'm actually getting something in the end yeah. worth paying for? So I think uh, the first thing is an understanding that ad campaigns take time. Like I typically try to tell people like, plan to be consistently spending money assessing and adjusting your ads for six months. Um, I know a lot of people like to say, you know, like, oh, uh, you know, within two weeks, your inbox is going to be slammed, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Right. Um, for small businesses, it's a lot. You've got to establish brand recognition and get, you know, like your fans out there championing you. And then, so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's kind of a longer process for smaller brands and less known individuals. So one, understanding that. Um, Two is understanding your business goals. Like, cause that, I mean, your business mm -hmm. goals guide your marketing and therefore should guide your marketing spending. What is the most valuable thing at the end of that six months that I want? It's, it may not be emails, you know, it may right. be people landing on your website and learning about you. Um, I think a lot of people get into it thinking that, you know, I'm gonna have that message button on there and I'm gonna get a million messages and I'm gonna get a million responses and like, you're going to sit down with someone like me and they're going to be like, you're not going to run anything with a button on it for three months other yeah. than like maybe a landing page to your website or like, you know, like right. just to get eyeballs because then you can go in and you can retarget people and then you can get their emails. Mm -hmm. But you've got to understand that like the algorithms are very finicky. Um, like LinkedIn on any given day can cost eight times what Facebook does for a pair of eyeballs. Mm. Like, so you've got to understand That's like, huge. That's yeah, huge. yeah, yeah. Your spend isn't going to be the same. You're like, you're not going to be getting people just mess DMing you right. and handing mm -hmm. you $10,000 and you're like, all right, return on ad spend. I've got it marked down. Like yeah. you've, you've really got to understand that like, what is your long-term business goal and how do the digital ads like supplement that? Um, cause if your long-term business goal is more sales, well then the entire six months is geared towards getting more sales. Right. If your goal is to get more emails or more contacts, get, you know, more people to see a listing. Well, like for that six month period, you, you've got to build it out structured around that. So I think a lot of people get started and, you know, they only think about running ads when they have, you know, one particular event they're trying to sell tickets to mm -hmm, or right. one home that they're trying to sell or one, right. you know, mm -hmm. product that they're trying to push. They get tunnel vision. Yes. And it, they, they, your marketing goals should be what your business goal. And that's long term. Nobody mm -hmm. says, all right, I'm going to sell, you know, all the tickets to this event and I'm done. I'm never hosting an event. Like it's a long term game to have a business. So, so is there even a point in doing that sort of, I have tickets to this event and mm -hmm. I need to push them sort of campaign. Does that make sense? I mean, so I've done that successfully with like some smaller organizations, uh, not for profits, especially. So like if you're bootstrap budget wise and you're trying to get people in the door for a charity, but you also have to understand like you have to have to have to have an established organic voice in order for that to work. Um, but if you are purely approaching it with a like sales pitch perspective, it, right. it's a long game. So if you're not for profit and you're hosting a charity ball and everybody in the city of Indianapolis knows who you are and you don't run ads consistently, but you know, you've got 50 bucks scrolled away and you're like, yeah, we'll promote this event. Absolutely. Go ahead and do that. But if you are, you know, just, trying to come people get people to your you know continuing ed class right. that's the only time you promote something it's 
kind of wasting your money. Yeah. So what are some of your, like, your favorite long-term successes you've seen? What platform is that on? What kind of industry mm -hmm. was that in? Like, yeah. what are some of your favorite, like, successes you've had? Um, so I guess some of my favorites uh, was actually probably, like, four or five months after I established a consistent like ad spend, like we got our budget approved, it was all metered out, and about four or five months later, we ran a concentrated campaign for an event we were hosting that's part of like an international sports league. Mm -hmm. And we've sold out before, but we sold out within one week of tickets being on sale because of that ad campaign. The the, yeah. the the like the people from the league wanted to like know our strategy yeah. and wanted to know mm -hmm. what we were doing because it, it was a record breaking sellout. Wow. wow. They were they were so curious and I was like, we've been doing this for four and five months and yeah. I've been here for eight months just building our content up. Right. Yeah. Like getting people aware that we even exist. Cause like sometimes it feels like you're shouting in the wind. Like you can have five thousand followers and mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, we yeah. reached five hundred people. Like right. great. But if you you digged in the trenches and you're working and you're right. working, when you do choose to run ads and you do it strategically, it's it's a heat. that was just so it's long term success, mm -hmm. but the public sees sees it as a short term yes. victory. Kind yeah. Of oh yeah. yeah. They don't yeah. understand that yeah. there is all of that work going into it, and then to have it like I mean, I literally had people in our DMs, and we've hosted this event. I mean, almost since the company was founded. We had people in our DMs who've lived in Indiana their whole lives and had no idea that this event was hosted. And I was like, we're, like, guys, this is what we have to keep doing. So yeah. that was always gratifying. Just recently I had a client, and this is a really small one, um, and I'm gonna give her numbers just to kind of, like literally let yeah. people know what we're doing. She had under 50 emails on her emailing list when we got started. Okay. Small, she's a solopreneur, she's amazing. We've been working together for three months and she has over 200. Wow, and yeah. that's, that's cool. where it's living right now is the yeah. email. Yes, right? yeah. On and the it, email. And so like, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't through a Facebook ad that she was running. It was literally, she took the time to sit down with a professional like me and take herself seriously and her business seriously. Right. And she built out her content strategies and we we're getting things posted regularly. And just like having like that sort of partnership and that sort of promotion got her to be more aggressive and concise with her branding like when she's at markets. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so she started getting more people, you know, scanning her Instagram code, which she never thought to put on her point of sale, but now yeah. it's like a plaque right in front. So when people yeah. are checking out, they can just scan it. Right. Absolutely. And she, you know, like, like being very aggressive with asking people for their emails and stuff. And like, I pointed it out to her and I was like, you like, that's so small, but literally look at the technical data. Yeah, that's you've got to you be grow. your own ambassador. Yeah, and just from, you know, treating it as a priority and understanding that it is a long game and you've got to do a lot of hard work right now. Right, because you don't own your platform. Mm -hmm. You own your email list, but yeah. you don't own your, own your exactly. platform. Exactly, yeah. That's huge. Oh. Mm -hmm. So for a perspective of getting started, mm -hmm. you're saying I need to have six months already committed and outlined from a marketing campaign perspective to know what am I going to be talking about already during that period of time? Yep. What are my ads um, that kind of fit into the categories that tell the story I'm already telling yep. through my free services or mm -hmm. my free discussions? Um, how much money do I need to set aside for that six month period? Um, I, I'm a big fan of scaling strategies where you start small and go big. It really does vary person to person, especially based on industry because different industries are more competitive. Sure. Smaller audiences, more expensive conversions, things like that. Um, so six months, if you're spending 200 a month on the high end, you need to be looking at setting aside like 1500 just to put into the algorithm. You can get by with spending less per month and you'll do cheaper, shorter chunks, you know, right. run something for 50 bucks for two weeks just to see what some numbers kind of look like. Right. Um, but what numbers do I even need to be looking at, right? I mean, if you were to tell me today mm -hmm. to log into my ad campaign, build an ad, mm -hmm. first of all, I'm going to be taking to like YouTube or can you give us any kind of resources or recommendations to just get some self-education? Yeah. Um, so Facebook has this thing called Blueprint, which literally walks you through it's their publication 
it does a decent job. It's not the best. A lot of the information is already outdated. Um, so two of my favorite places to go to are the Facebook chat rooms because there's someone who has gotten fed up with what you're fed up with and has asked a question and somebody else has come to their help or Reddit. Yeah. Like, um, what subreddits? Oh gosh. I'm going to put you on the spot. I honestly don't have them memorized. No, no. I just like pick up threads and things like that. And then just save them and pay attention to like what notifications are going. I get a lot of notifications. Every single morning I wake up with over 150 push notifications on my phone every morning. God bless you. Those are kind of the resources that I really push people towards. Um, there's a format within Facebook called guided creation uh, versus quick creation. Okay. Guided creation literally walks you through how to set up an ad. Um, okay. That's huge. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't know how. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, do do a little bit of your research too when you are first picking your objective if you're running an ad on Facebook, um, because some of their terminology is kind of like, mm -hmm. like what exactly does this mean? And again, just Google right. it. Facebook will have their explanation of it. But some, you know, there's always going to be a HubSpot blog or social media examiner right. blog that'll give you a little bit more information about it. Yeah. Speaking of, are there any podcasts or books or any resources like those that you can recommend that would be great spaces? for us to even mm -hmm. just wrap our brain around yeah. concepts or you know when you when you talk about creating a six month strategy when I hire somebody like you mm -hmm. do I already need to have that strategy can I expect that you'll help me create that strategy mm -hmm. what do I where do I need to start yeah so um some good listenings that I like um Social Media Examiner has a podcast yeah. that does a pretty I great job uh, they have two shows Social Media Marketing World's uh, mm -hmm. Michael Selzner's show. Yes. Yep. And then there's another one that his team does, I think. Yeah. We'll, we'll put some links to that in the show notes And who below. was the guy who did Marketing Revolution? Every once in a while I tune into his podcast. That's a good one. I don't know that one. Yeah. I like Buffers. Social yeah. media, um, the science of social media, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. That's got a good one. There's a really short, concise, and usually very data based on their actual okay. audiences. Like they'll, they'll pull, you know, buffer is huge. So they've yeah. got a pretty good listener base to just kind of get a baseline for. Um, but I love those stuff, like those resources, those small mm -hmm. little nuances, because I mean, as I understand it, most of it is just guesstimating and oh, a then lot of it. chasing what is working, right? It's, it's oh, yeah. not necessarily a perfect and it, I science. mean, it's, it always changes. Yeah. Like you, like... You're at the mercy of the algorithm. You they really don't want are. you to figure it out, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why I also like tell people like switch it up. Don't run the same ad for you know five months in a row. You can turn things off and turn them back on. Sure. But you know it's important not to fatigue your ads. Run them for too much. Get too many people seeing them the, over and over and over again. Right. Um, but circling back to like I talk about the six month strategy. It's best to have a professional lay that out for you. Otherwise, you're taking shots in the dark. But again. Yeah. Be prepared to pay the professional to do that while they're not actually running ads. I think that's something that people get really confused about. Like, oh, well, we're not running ads, so I'm not going to pay you. Well, mm -hmm. like, I've built out six months of strategy for you, so. Right. Yeah. Um, get the most bang for your buck if you can. Hire somebody who can do the creative side of it okay. um, as Where well. would you begin to even find people, or how would you describe that job description mm -hmm. to hire? Um, some of us, some, some of us, some of us call ourselves media buyers. Some of us simply refer to ourselves as digital marketers. Um, honestly, my favorite best recommendation would be go into a co-working space here in Indy. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. go into the speakeasy, go into, what is it? Platform 24, platform 24 mm -hmm. and just start or like, hatch, any of yeah, them. just start nosing around. Like I can think of like 10 people in just those three co-working spaces that I know. That okay. could help you. Like and so maybe a social media post would be a great place mm -hmm. to start. Yeah. Like make a post, say, do you know somebody? If you don't, like reach out because I mean that's the other perk to a co working space is it's literally a Rolodex of professionals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um yeah, that that's where I would say start looking. Um I, I advocate for the individuals or the local agencies that are doing it. Um because you can go online and you can hire a large company. Oh, yeah. You're We've gonna all get seen promo.com. Yeah. You're going to get a rep who, you know, they hold X amount of accounts and things like that. Um, Why is that a bad idea? Because they do it nationwide and they do it as quickly as possible. And um, if you outsource that way, too, and I've run into this, like, you don't know what exactly they're doing. 
especially if they're not showing you, if they're not proofing it with you, things like that. So you really want to look at, you're working with this person for six months, right. over mm -hmm. six months if they're building it out for you. You really want to think of it as like a partnership because they're, they're spending your money. Right. You, you would not mm -hmm. hand a stranger your debit card and say go, but a right. lot of people do for ad buying and it's, I would highly advise against it. I would say try to work with an individual or a local agency that has individual connections. Because I subcontract with an agency here in Indy, but we're very, very small and we're very personal. We're in the room with our clients monthly, at least. Mm -hmm. So don't don't just, you know, call quickads.com right, right and write a blank check. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what are some prerequisites that maybe we should be asking those candidates before mm -hmm. we determine they're worthy of our partnership? Yeah, I'm a bit of a negativity here, but I'm not gonna start with the what we should be asking them. I'm gonna start with what you absolutely do not ask them. What are your conversions look like on other accounts? Mm -hmm. what, what type of click rate can you guarantee me? Here's why. Those are the metrics that get small businesses screwed by those large companies that they just cold call and hand their mm -hmm. card information to. Because um, they think those are impressive figures. You can, you can lie. You can get the data to tell whatever story you want it to. Mm. You really, really can. Yeah. It's different industry to industry. Even if you're working with someone who's niched, it's different location to location. How much background work have they been doing? So one, don't ask them that. What you really want to do is you want to go in and figure out like, what is this individual's philosophy? Um, I, I'm a big saver. I like to very conservatively spend mm -hmm. my money. Um, and if you are, you're like, I've got lots of capital, let's go. Right. Find someone who's on that same level with you. Um, if there's someone who's gonna do everything in their power to get emails for your email list, and that's your goal, <laughs> right. work with that person. Right. Um, if you can find somebody <coughs> who can do like the photography and the copywriting, like get to f figure out what their strengths are, what their internal motivators are, figure out how that aligns with your brand. Because the other thing too, is once somebody starts running these ads, they're also getting all the notifications for those ads. So do you, are you gonna be handling those questions and responses or do you want someone mm -hmm. who can do that for you? That's another thing that you need to be considering. Well, that's huge. Exactly. Do you even want somebody to have that much power? Because you may not want them to be able to respond, mm -hmm. but it needs to be someone that you trust enough to have that power mm -hmm. because they could, do whatever they want. Right. Yeah. Is there anything, I think I've heard you talk about this before and I don't mm -hmm. know the circumstances which it applies. I think it's super valuable information. Mm -hmm. You talk about how they will run campaigns from their own analytics or their own sites. Oh, yeah. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. There's a business page on Facebook, but there's actually a business account on Facebook. And then underneath that business account, is your business page. So it's kind of like a hierarchy thing. And then under that as well is an ad account. Okay. So if you just half-heartedly boost a post and you've never created an ad account, it creates it attached to you, like your individual profile. Okay. But if you go through business.facebook.com to create that overarching business account and then have a business page, you can create an ad account under that, right? Um, a lot of agencies, will essentially assign an ad account to you. They'll create one and they'll assign it to your business and they'll attach it to your business and then they'll give you a pixel code and tell you to plug that into the back side of your website for conversions and then that is all owned by and under them. Um, you can get added on as an admin if you ask, if you're savvy enough to ask for that. I wouldn't even go that far. I would create your own ad account, get your own pixel, make sure that they don't have the ability to kick you off of it, which means that like they're the owner and the creator. Like right. you, you have to do that. Um, With they're the owner and the creator of what exactly? The ads manager account. Okay, so they get the data. Is that mm -hmm. what they're getting? Yes. So like for retargeting and yes. for results of the campaigns? Yes, they own all of that. Um, so every time someone goes to your website and there's like, you know, the cookies and they, they own that. You don't own the cookies of those people suddenly, mm -hmm. even though they're trafficking on your website. So you always want to make sure it's your ad account, your pixel code. So you've said pixel several times. Yes. But I'm not certain everybody knows what a pixel is. Yep. So can you maybe describe that in a little bit more? 
yeah. detail. It's just a simple piece of trackable code that goes in a header on a website. They're invisible. You can't see them. They're on every website you go to. If you get that pop-up that says, we use cookies, they have a pixel installed. And that's mm -hmm. all it is. It's always a Facebook pixel or are there no. different pixels for different There are different, different pixels. It's a generic term for different types of ad platforms. Um, okay. So there's a Google pixel. And a LinkedIn. And there's, a, a Google uses a different term. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all tracking codes. They're all synonymous. <laughs> so are these the codes that show us the exact pair of shoes that we were just looking at on DSW yes. the next time we're on Facebook? Yes, but say you leave whatever company was running those ads to get those shoes in your feed. Well, when you stop working with that company and go to another company, you can no longer retarget Danielle to get that perfect shoe, pair of shoes in her feed because they took their data with them. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. Okay, mm. so it's substantial. That yes. it, I mean, it's huge for you mm. to ha own your yes. own ads manager. Yeah. So can I give someone access to my Absolutely. ads manager? Yeah. Um, it's always like the most painful thing I do because it's so confusing and I typically just try to tell people like to sit down with me and let me log into all their stuff. Um, Cause it's very easy to add someone like me, right, right. but in order to get everything set up and structured properly, like they've got to be logged into the owner's personal account, Facebook account and right. get everything structured right. and set up. I've coached people through it over the phone and it's a nightmare. How often do you find that people have multiple business pages? It's become less common, but it is still very prevalent. So for instance, like groups and pages, obviously two different things. Mm -hmm. But if, if I don't own a page, I as a business have not established a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. is, is there still a way for people to go and like or check in through those old profiles? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can still engage with those all the time. Okay. I mean, could you ever convert those pages to run ad campaigns or to be able to capitalize on? You can merge them. Um, under yeah you have to claim them and obviously like substantiate that like this is my business um which is often really easy if you have like a super active page and then you're trying to claim because facebook's pretty good at putting two and two together like okay. you are the real business so mm -hmm. right right but yeah no you can claim it the issue becomes when like you've created multiple actual pages and not yeah. just places. So what you're referring to is often called a place. Yes. And they've done away with those for the most part because mm -hmm. they've tried to force people to create a business page. But when you create multiple business pages and not just a place on Facebook that you can claim, there's a lot that can go wrong in trying to merge those. So I want to talk LinkedIn for a few minutes. So I know Danielle and I definitely have our eyes mm -hmm. set on LinkedIn mm -hmm. for this next year. So. Yeah. Talk about the importance of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Talk about its value to a business or an individual. Yeah. Um, so I guess the value, again, depends on what's your business goal. Because mm -hmm. um, it is true, you know, like LinkedIn is for professionals. Uh, it is having a renaissance. The algorithm is performing a lot better and people are using it a lot more. Um, but you really, like, you wouldn't go onto LinkedIn to start running ads t for shoes. Like right. to try to get people right. to buy shoes. Right. Um, it's a fantastic network for speaking professionally, talking about your niche, your area, conversing with other people. Think of it almost as like a chamber chat room, okay. to like trying mm -hmm. to communicate with um, other professionals in the area and things like that. Um, but if you're trying to run ads, Again, like it's got to be really strategic. Like if you're hiring, run an ad on LinkedIn, duh. Mm -hmm. If right. you're trying to get people to buy a professional service like a CPA, run an ad on LinkedIn. So tell me, thing. tell me about the the feed on LinkedIn because mm -hmm. so I see a feed. I see posts from people who are in my network. Mm -hmm. So and I've read and I've heard a lot of stories about people going viral very quickly on LinkedIn. So tell me about that a little bit more. I guess it's just because of like the ecosystem, like it's still, um, it's, it's booming, like it's growing. Mm -hmm. Um, so there is a lot of people like flocking to it, trying to use it more. And so LinkedIn's always had that first, second, third degree connection system, yeah. mm -hmm. which is literally a written out example of how an algorithm works. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. always been that way. And Three we've and a half degrees of separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've always just ignored that. Like this person is a third level connection. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is literally the algorithm saying, okay, they are connected to him. So you're connected to him. That's right. literally how the algorithm works. Yes. So that's why all those people are showing up in your feed. 
And show of hands here, like how many people like just get random connection requests, right? All the time. Like it's nonstop, right? Yeah. So I'll, show, I'll raise my hand. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, and I let them pile up, and that's part of why it's so easy to go viral is because there's this, and I hate this school of thought. Connect with someone new every day. Go on to LinkedIn and find that third level yeah. connection and mm -hmm. send them a connection request whether you know them or not mm -hmm. and so a lot of people are like pushing that mentality because you know then you know. I'm really curious your thoughts because I have always I'm literally in my previous lives I was forced to take classes mm -hmm. that were sponsored classes by LinkedIn to teach us as corporate executives how to engage mm -hmm. and to leverage the power of LinkedIn yeah. for sales yeah and it was always the conversation of, do you add people whom you haven't actually done business with because is it a true referral network? Yeah. Or is it just a free for all and you're just sending out a bunch of friend requests on a hope and a prayer somebody's gonna accept it? Yeah. I is there a strategy? Like what what it's is the a, game? It's a social media network, so you should be attempting to be social. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cultivate social engagement. But again, like you know, if a random person goes and follows you on Instagram, cool, you've got another follower. Mm -hmm. But do you go and follow that person back, especially if you have no idea who they are? Right, yeah. Like, right. Mm -hmm. you wouldn't. So a connection request is very finite. You mm -hmm. accept it, you're connected to them. Right. Which means their content or somebody they know's content mm -hmm. is going right. to start showing that up. That line is drawn. Yeah. And so why would you... Why would you want to water down your own feed for something like that? Right. So I, I agree with you 100%, but I was running media for a company mm -hmm. here in Indy, and um, the business was going and adding, their, they were a downtown company, and they were adding everyone oh, from yeah. downtown. It, she, they saw success with it, but I, again, mm -hmm. you're connected it's with a gamble. these people forever, or not forever, right. but right. you know, you definitely watered your feed down with everyone. But yes. sh they, I keep saying she, but they did see success with doing it roulette style. I yeah. Guess. Oh yeah, it's it's a gamble. Like it really is roulette style because yeah. you can see it pay off or you can see it not pay off. I feel like I feel like a lot of people are in the space where I'm just gonna go and like fumble Dabble. around on this yeah. and, and just people are keep dabbling and yeah. they're not really sure the strategy. I don't think there's a lot of strategy going on. Like I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of strategy going. On. I would like to see more. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I would We're like to be one. more. Yes. I, we would <laughs> like to be more intentional and yeah. and and navigate LinkedIn for next year. Yeah. The only uh, person I know who's very like consistent and strategic with her LinkedIn per posting, I'm not going to mention her name, is literally only because she sits in a cubicle at a corporate office all day and is extremely bored and the only social media platform she can get on is LinkedIn. Uh, and so the only people she posts about is her corporate employer, but she just sits on there and she's very consistent about sharing their articles and things like that. But like, again, because right. it's right. the only thing she can scroll through. Right. Yeah. And um, maybe another employer would see that that um, she's promoting her own company uh -huh. yeah. as yeah. well. Maybe those yeah. recruiter. I'm, I'm sure her DM box <laughs> is full. Yes. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've chatted a lot about the differences between platforms and ad campaigns, but I'm really curious from a perspective of gaining some clarity and some focus, mm -hmm. where do you re recommend people get started? Should they be starting on platforms that they already have some momentum behind? Mm -hmm. Should they be starting somewhere new in a space that they maybe haven't spent a lot of time mm -hmm. like LinkedIn? What do you really recommend to focus on? So I guess that depends on who your audience is. So like doing the math, and like going into your analytics and figuring out, you know, like what's your demographic? What platform are they already engaging with you on? But you know, like statistics speaking wise, what platform are they using the most? Cause I think a lot of people fall, especially like this past couple of years during the transition, a lot of people would be like, oh, everyone's engaging on Instagram. I'm gonna stay there or on Facebook. But then they come to read their analytics and a lot of that audience has been transitioning to Instagram. So paying attention to where your audience is engaging with you, but where they actually are, not just where you think they are, and spending mm -hmm. the money there. Um, so, what's your favorite social platform right now? None of them. I hate them all. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Are you speaking from a personal usage perspective? <laughs> no, I hate. I hate all of them. No. Which um, one do you hate the least? Uh, Twitter, because I love it personally. Okay. I, again, I would never advocate to run money on <laughs> on LinkedIn for or Twitter for most brands. Uh, there are some niches like NASCAR is real big. Racing, the yeah. racing industry. On Twitter? Huge on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Are Museums. you a NASCAR fan? 
No. Okay. I, I didn't beg you as such. I was just so curious. No, but, you look, said but that like, first. You, like, you know these things. And museums. The museums. museum network is huge on Twitter. Oh. So, like, Interesting. again, pay read, attention to where your people are at because it's weird. That is weird. <laughs> I read a statistics that talked about where different generations get their news from. And they were saying Gen Z gets their news from Twitter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, they recognized that trend back when I was in college. And Twitter really honed in on those moments and things like that mm -hmm. that allowed them to develop their Capitalize tech. On and, the yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I cannot get over the people who are willing to this day to still casually spend money monthly on a billboard and will go Oh yeah, they will. Yeah, and the, and they'll be like, mm, two hundred dollars a month on digital marketing advertises digital marketing advertising is a little steep. And it, so I mean you really like yeah, every person you're interested in targeting and is driving on that interstate. That's cool. Where are they actually paying attention? <laughs> they're driving on the interstate looking at their phones. Yes. That's what yes, they're doing. Yes. That's they what are. they're doing. There's a statistic <laughs> oh out gosh. there about that. The, yeah. Like, people are more likely to see your social media ad on mm -hmm. their cell phone while driving yep. yes. than see your billboard ad. And I also, I love, like, I love looking, in the, and this goes back to the creative aspect, like, there is nuance to the difference between a billboard cre piece of creative and a social media piece of creative. And it, it just, you've got to, you really have to pay attention to that. You can't just, you know, mm -hmm. slap the same ad on Facebook, on Instagram, yeah. on LinkedIn, on a billboard. I'm like, so glad you mm -hmm. said that. I'm curious what form of creative should we be focusing on? So we hear statistics like, Videos perform, mm -hmm. perform 86 times better mm -hmm. than any other form of media that we can create. So should we be doing video ads or should we be doing still ads? Should it be a mix of both? Um, so I advocate for a mix. Um, Facebook just recently, and I don't know if you intentionally asked me this question, but Facebook just recently settled because at times they inflated video watch rates by 900%. Nine Wait, zero say, zero percent that again. They inflated video views by nine hundred percent in their algorithm. At times, the low end was one hundred and fifty percent. What does that mean to me in plain English? They lied to you about how many people were seeing your video. And what gain does Facebook have by doing that? They encourage more people to run videos and post videos and run ads because the better the numbers look, the more people are willing to spend money. Yeah. And the people that are using ads or using video, I should say, mm -hmm. not just ads, are spending more time on platform, which at the end of the day is really what exactly. wants. Yeah, they mm -hmm. want people to stay on that platform. Um, so cycling back to what you say, I would use a diversity, always. Because like I said, you can make data tell whatever story you want it to. I was at a talk last week and they phrased it that way and I, I'm addicted to it. Because you right, can. Right. And I've seen it you happen. You can make statistics say whatever you want it to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so diversify, diversify, diversify. Like do not put all of your eggs in one basket. Do not spend all of your money on a single promotional video. Like if you are shooting all day, you should walk away and have... Right. A, a library. Right. Mm -hmm. Content that transcends weeks and months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like, those videos, too, can double as stills. Like, it's not going to be the best quality, but, you know, like, right. oh, mid-filming, screen grab, there right. you go. You And, I mean, it's that simple to, you know, turn a video into a still. Right. I mean, you've got... Especially if you're going to opaque the background and put a pretty caption on the front of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can I wrap my brain around it? So I'll just use, you know, what Chas does mm -hmm. with um, Content Queens is yeah. a great example. Mm -hmm. You know, they offer an opportunity to come in and say, hey, listen, if you don't know what your media needs to be, if you don't know what your marketing is, we'll sit down and we'll help you kind of map that out ahead of time so that when we actually do have the shoot that yeah. you hired us to do, we know what it is that we're shooting, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a pretty unique service, and, yeah. and they're offering that because nobody else is really doing yeah. that. Is that something that they could, as they, I say, a business owner, mm -hmm. could get from a social media consultant or an advertising? I, I'm just curious, oh, yeah, like, title-wise, who should people be asking to collaborate with to get this sort of insight? Yeah, um, so there are a million and one titles. I mean, you really just have to talk to people. Like, I mean, on my LinkedIn, I'm a digital marketing consultant and you wouldn't like blatantly know that I run ads. I mean, so I mean, I'm, most content creators have run ads because it just falls in line with right. what they're expected to be capable to do. Right. Um, 
So really just, it is, it's a lot of like looking around and trying to figure out. But yeah, $500 a month should be able to get you someone to just, that's their focus for you and that's what they're taking care of. And I promise you, you're one, gonna get better results for those dollars spent in the algorithm. Two, how much of your time would you have had to spend on Facebook Blueprint, on YouTube, on Learning how to do all Reddit. the things. Yeah. And, not, and then ended up not doing it right, not mm -hmm. doing it correctly and just throwing those dollars away. Yeah. So we always ask everybody one question on this show. What is the best lesson you learned from the worst business decision you ever made? I don't really think I've got like a worst business decision. Like there's not, I mean, luckily I'm not old enough to be like, oh my God, I wasted $20,000 on this project. So I, 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 have, I haven't yet to run into something like that, but I guess like I've definitely had bad experiences. And I guess the big thing I would say is just like be careful with like your heart. Um, Cause especially as women, we put a lot of heart into what we do. Mm -hmm. We do not go half-heartedly. We, we put ourselves into our work. At least when we do, that's the, when you're gonna get the best results. Mm -hmm. So for all the female solopreneurs, entrepreneurs out that, mm -hmm. I guess that one, be prepared to get a little hurt emotionally, but be careful. Like when you go into these partnerships, like you need to understand like, who am I doing business with? Like mm -hmm. who, who's gonna be understanding, who's gonna be patient, because there are gonna be days where Facebook just isn't working and you can't publish their ad. And is it a type of person who's going to get frustrated with you and send you a rough email and you're gonna cry because you were super invested and like trying to like make them happy and Zuckerberg's counting his dollars while you're crying because you can't run an ad. Right. So be careful with who you who you work with and because you're going to become emotionally attached to all of the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're working with them for at least six months on a project. Mm -hmm. I love it. This has been great. Thanks so much for Thank sitting you. down and chatting with us, Jordan. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So before we wrap it up with you, Jordan, we'd love to tell our audience, where can people learn more about you and connect with you if they're looking to learn more about your business? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at jshea. Um, I spell it J-E-A underscore S-H-E-A. Shea is in Shea Butter. Um, that's a huge platform that I run off of currently. You can obviously find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, just shoot me a DM sometime. Add me on Facebook. Yeah, I all don't the have socials. All well, all the socials except Twitter. That's that's my home. That's my space. <laughs> don't go, don't go find me on Twitter. That's mine. <laughs> all right, guys, we're gonna link all of Jordan's socials in the show notes below, and of course. Check us out on Insta because we're going to be sharing the love with Jordan over the next week. Thanks again for sitting down with us. It was great to chat over coffee. Love it. Always a pleasure. See you guys next week.